Righto. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another one of our Ocean Protect webinars. We've got a special guest today, uh, Ian Adams. How are you, Ian? Keeping well? Good, thanks. Uh, very good, very good. And look, um, we are going to start bang on time. It's just on 12.30 on my watch. Um, just to give people a little bit of opportunity to come through the turnstiles. Um, and, and, and it should be pointed out, this, this has been another very popular webinar um, topic. I think we've got over 220 registrations today. Uh, so I'll give people a little bit more time to come through the door. Um, but look, just a very quick blurb about some ocean protect news uh, before we hear from Ian. Um, first up, I guess we get to celebrate a birthday. Um, ocean Protect have recently turned 20 years old, would you believe? Um, so kudos to everyone who's been involved uh, in Ocean Protect shenanigans to date. Um, certainly a, a fantastic achievement. Um, oh, sorry, am I, am I quite quiet? Thank you, Michelle. I'm gonna turn my uh, microphone up a little bit. Um, you let me know, Michelle, if I'm too loud all of a sudden. How's that, Ian? Is that okay at your end? I'm going to, so uh, Michelle, I'm going to leave you as my audio engineer. If that sounds okay or better, um, please let me know. But if, it, if I'm too loud or still too soft, um, please let me know as well. But thanks for the, uh, the uh, heads up. Uh, but look, oh, there you go. Much better. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, but yeah, I should protect turn 20. Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, in terms of some other milestones, we should uh, give a quick shout out to these uh, ridic ridiculously good looking gentlemen, uh, Adrian Harut and Fotos recently celebrated 10 years at Ocean Protect. So well done to those uh, guys, uh, great achievement. I look a very quick plug for the podcast. And since we last did our, um, our last webinar, we've done four, we released four more podcasts. Um, they're always available on basically anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify and iTunes. And probably if you're a stormwater person, I suspect you might be if you're tuning into this webinar. I reckon the the one with um, uh, on tires and coho salmon um, is an absolute doozy if you're a stormwater professional. Um, but obviously the other ones are pretty cool as well. Um, and I know engineers love uh, seeing things getting built. So this is some happy snaps from, uh, this is a photo literally of last week of a Filtera bioretention system. There's two of these um, out at the Mills development in New Norfolk in Tasmania. Um, and so look, just some very quick happy snaps of the construction of these, there's two of these systems. Um, so that, that was basically basin one before we got start, started getting involved. So basically someone dug a hole and we essentially put um, boarded it up, put uh, geotextile, a liner, et cetera, put the uh, under drainage in uh, and the gravel and the bubble up pipes, et cetera, uh, and eventually the, the filter media, and then planted this thing out. Um, and it kind of looks a bit like that. Um, so that's a 60 square uh, area, um, treating a catchment of about two hectares. So it's sized at 0.3% of the upstream catchment. Uh, it won't come online for about two years. So it's basically water physically can't get into it. Um, so the plants will establish during that time. Um, and once the upstream lot scale works is sort of more or less done, uh, we'll bring it online and have it treating water from the development. And that's the Mills, de Mills development. So this is the one basin. There's actually two already built. Uh, and this is the construction of the second one. So again, same story, dug a big hole, uh, filled it with, um, uh, just boarded it up, a geotextile liner, et cetera. Uh, put some media down, some gravel, um, obviously the pipes, et cetera. Uh, and then the uh, filter media. And then ultimately we planted the thing out. And uh, again, same story, a whole bunch of fancy erosion sediment control upstream to protect the system for the next two years. Uh, and I should point out a big shout out to, there was a whole bunch of guys involved in the construction of this thing. Obviously, shout out to our own Blake Allingham from Ocean Protect. I know who's dialing into this one, but there was also a big shout out to Jason from Hudson Civil, uh, the Neva Group, and also um, guys from Ute Earth Moving who um, helped out Blake as well. Uh, speaking of Filtera Bio, um, there's just literally half the press just been published in the Water E-Journal, a uh, published paper um, describing the performance monitoring undertaken at Western City University. That's about four years worth of monitoring now um, and um, systems going really well, uh, achieving really good removal rates of TSS, TN, TP, uh, et cetera. So really interesting little system there. 
Uh, and look, if you like webinars, just a reminder that all our webinars are recorded uh, and the slides and the recordings are made, made available on our uh, Ocean Protect website under the webinars tab. So if you've missed out on anything uh, previously or today, need to duck off early, you can get it there. Uh, also, quick plug to our next webinar, which is uh, in late July, uh, and that's um, by Craig Fairball from uh, the States. He, Craig's actually presented uh, one or two webinars, super popular, uh, and he's back again to talk about uh, long-term performance and mass loading uh, for bioretention systems. Obviously, his research is predominantly uh, based in the States, but um, very interesting uh, piece of work by Craig, which I'll, I'll keep in suspense and uh, let you dial in and hear more about that. Uh, and look, but without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with Ian, um, Ian is the uh, Director of Organica Engineering and is a sustainability engineer with over 20 years experience. He's got a whole bunch of uh, you know, experience delivering ESD into various developments and buildings. Uh, he's a certified assessor and trainer for the Green Building Council of Australia. And he's also been instrumental in developing a whole bunch of toolkits for our industry, including GreenStar, BESS, and Insight Water. So without further ado, Ian, I can pass over the reins to you. Um, and just a reminder to everyone who's dialed in, and I can see we've got 127 in attendance. Um, unfortunately, Ian can only see himself and probably me as well. So trust me, Ian, there are people listening to um, both of us, <laughs> but um, looking for this presentation. But just a reminder, folks, if you do have a question you'd like to ask Ian, um, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, so in the Q&A tab, uh, if you just like a, a comment, say, Ian, great prezzo, love your work, feel free to put it in the chat. But he, certainly if you want a, a question asked, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, and there'll be plenty of time to uh, ask questions uh, to Ian after his presentation. Ian, we think it's going to take about 20 minutes of Ian talking, um, but after that, plenty of time to talk uh, and ask whatever questions you have. But without further ado, Ian. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. You're right. As an engineer, I I uh, do enjoy seeing pictures of things being built. So that was that was good. Thank you. No worries. Um, so yes, I'll dive straight into it. So today I just want to talk about uh, the role of buildings in stormwater. So um, as Brett said, I'm a sustainability engineer and um, have uh, a lot of experience uh, working both um, designing green buildings, but also uh, I guess uh, I'm currently got a secondment with uh, Knox Council, for example, where I've been for quite a long time to um, uh, review integrated water management in planning and building permits. So I guess uh, this um, talk comes out of my observations and frustrations uh, in seeing the role of building. So uh, first off, I guess, what, what are the opportunities with uh, with buildings in the stormwater system? Well, there are various uh, opportunities with, uh, with buildings um, around efficiency and drought resilience, um, uh, reducing volume and taking uh, water out of the stormwater system, improving stormwater water quality and reducing flow. Um, and from my experience, the, the opportunities are potentially, um, you know, a third buildings, a third local uh, level stuff with uh, council uh, and street scale and, and local um, bioretention and water treatment systems, and probably a third of the, the problem can be solved up and downstream with the, the large works and the regional infrastructure. Um, but I just want to talk about, I guess, buildings. Um, the ideas I'm talking about aren't necessarily uh, mine, they've been floating around uh, and part of discussion for many years, but I, I will point at the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Guide 2019, and particularly uh, book nine, which is right at the end of the, of the series. Um, but book nine is, is the book on urban water drainage. And um, what the ARNR says philosophically about urban drainage is it's no longer just about controlling peak discharge and flooding and draining things quickly, but it's also about integrated water management and harvesting and infiltrating stormwater or improving water quality as well. And um, the ARNR talks a lot about this idea of source control. Um, which is a volume management strategy where you have multiple criteria, small facilities widely distributed across the catchment and complements larger scale integrated urban water, mat, urban water strategy. So kind of talking about the buildings here and the stuff that goes on in private land. Now, where is this stuff useful? It's more useful in 
existing urban drainage systems uh, that are kind of at capacity and are facing a lot of redevelopment. So when we've got a new greenfield subdivision, we can design it right, we can put in all the, the larger scale water treatment and, and retention systems and, and it's all good uh, for new greenfield subdivisions. But when you've got an existing drainage system, a bit like Knox, um, it was put in for quarter acre blocks originally back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and we've got a whole lot of uh, redevelopment. So this is Knox Council in Melbourne. We've got a whole lot of redevelopment that looks like this. And essentially people have taken a backyard and made it impermeable from fence to fence. Um, and what this does is it funnels a whole load more water into our existing little street pipes. And um, it makes our, I guess our flooding, flooding frequency a lot more common. Um, and causes us a lot more problems as the catchment slowly gets paved. Um, and the same for commercial and industrial, quite often we'll get a lot of developments, looks like this, um, and if we're not careful, the entirety of every drop of water almost um, that hits this block will go into the old existing drainage uh, systems, which is uh, not, not great, but there are opportunities we're finding for the buildings to actually be uh, treating and storing and infiltrating water. Um, for the engineers out there, um, a little bit of a hydrograph, we've got our flow rate queue over time. And pre-development, we get these nice sort of black lines, not too picky, but uh, as development increases and paves everything, we get more spiky hydrographs, i.e. more flash flooding and more streams drying up in between. So why can't we just replace all our drainage system? Um, so I've been doing uh, a lot of work with Greater Dandy now actually on this. And the problem with just trenching up a street and replacing drainage systems is there's already stuff there. It can be very expensive. So this is um, a bit of an extreme example from an overseas CBD, but you can imagine trying to uh, fit in stormwater pipes when there's already water pipes and gas pipes and telecoms and optic fiber and and uh, all sorts of other things under there is not uh, not economic normally to upgrade an existing drainage system when each council is maybe sitting on um, tens of thousands of kilometers of pipes with a re replacement value in the in the hundreds of millions or billions um, once you factor the difficulties in. So. <coughs> What can we do with buildings? Um, once again, here's a graph for the engineers out there. Um, I know there's lots of you. Um, so we've got a hydrograph of a, of a building site. Uh, our pre-development um, is, uh, is this blue line here. And the amount of volume coming off it is the area under the, under the line. So this, this area. Um, Post-development, we get much more water coming off a site because it's a much more impervious area. So what we can do, we can try things like putting in on-site detention. So this doesn't change the volume, but it changes the flow rate. And that's that red line here. Uh, we can capture water um, and retain it. So that would be this dark blue area. Um, we can capture that in a rainwater tank or um, we can capture things and capture water and put it into the ground. So the hydrograph, if you would say catch, cap, capture and store, uh, the entirety of your storm uh, events, whether that's a one in five year or one in three year, it might look like this as the building outflow hydrograph. Um, or if we're just infiltrating more water, um, it might look more like a rural catchment. So essentially what this is saying is we can use buildings to take the pressure off drainage systems. Um, in terms of what's actually changed recently, um, just in, in June this year, the um, new Victorian EPA regulations have really ramped up and what they've done, um, the new stormwater laws in Victoria, is they've tried to implement this uh, uh, picture that a lot of you might have seen before. It's the idea that a forested catchment would evapotranspirate and infiltrate probably 80% of uh, stormwater, whereas a highly developed catchment as much as 80% of that uh, water will run off immediately. So um, what the EPA has done is actually set targets uh, for infiltration and uh, harvesting stormwater to try and get the urban catchment to behave more like a forested catchment. And they've set uh, these values based on the rainfall and also whether it's a high priority area with natural streams or, or not. Um, 
So that's the new EPA regulations. Um, they've also kept the familiar 45% uh, nitrogen target um, and phosphorus and suspended solids and litter targets uh, for buildings and stormwater. Um, but under the, uh, the new regulations, it is a requirement uh, for buildings to manage their stormwater under the Environment Protection Act. Um, we've also got uh, relatively new, we've got Green Star, there's a new waterway protection credit up to four points to protect local, local waterways. And once again, uh, we do this nitrogen target. Um, the phosphorus is slightly high, higher in Green Star, but we've also added in Green Star a 40% or 80% volume reduction target in Green Star, and that's an annual average uh, volume reduction with the idea that if you're removing uh, volume regularly, you're um, helping to protect the local drainage system and uh, create more uh, natural um, urban hydrographs by capturing and infiltrating more water. Um, so also in Green Star, um, which is quite topical this week, we have a resilience category. So there's only a certain amount you can do, I guess, with uh, harvesting and, and infiltrating stormwater. But when the really big one hits, like has in, in Sydney just now, um, you know, there is an element of just keeping buildings out of the way of the storm uh, or making them more resilient uh, to the flooding. So, um, and what we're seeing all around the world is there's an exponential relationship between relative humidity and the amount of rainfall that can fall in any particular time. So um, every city on, in the globe at the moment is getting exponentially bigger floods. And that's just uh, the simple physics of relative humidity. Warmer air can carry exponentially more water and therefore the floods are exponentially bigger. It's, it's simple physics. Um, but I guess if we ask, well, what is best practice uh, in a building for stormwater these days? Um, if you take, say, a commercial building, um, looking at resilience, you might make sure that your flood levels and your one in a hundred year RLs are uh, at a safe level. Um, you might make sure that nothing uh, valuable or, or fragile is on the ground level. So your, your plant room and your switchboards might be uh, up at the top of the building instead of down the bottom. Uh, and you might, you know, even put car park or something um, on, on the bottom levels just, just to improve that resilience. So if it does flood, um, the, the repairs are not, uh, not too catastrophic. Um, the building might also have some stormwater gear to uh, improve nitrogen and phosphorus and TSS kind of outcomes, or if there's a hydrocarbon uh, requirement to, to treat. This can be a natural system or a manufactured product. Um, and also uh, we're encouraging a lot more permeable surfaces. So permeable paving, which um, can be used selectively, you know, in the high traffic areas, you might use ordinary concrete, but um, have permeable surfaces uh, for driveways and car parks in these, in these buildings. Um, the building will also use water efficient, efficiently and, and capture as much water as possible for reuse in the building or just to hold it back for detention. Um, and when you are, we find that when you are developing buildings in this way, uh, it does take, uh, I guess, the pressure off the stormwater systems um, in terms of the amount of upgrades and upstream and downstream um, uh, infrastructure augmentation that the councils and water authorities actually have to undertake if the buildings um, are being rebuilt. Um, in a uh, integrated water management fashion. So the question I also wanted to address quickly in this webinar, because we, we don't have a lot of time, is, is the how. Um, so I guess I've got a long history of frustration of reviewing really poor integrated water management designs for buildings and uh, just going, look, it can't be that difficult um, to get a good design that integrates these different cri multiple criteria in a systems thinking fashion, but uh, we'll point out the, the sweet spot where you can actually implement these different uh, multiple criteria. Um, so uh, I guess the project that uh, I've been uh, involved with and it's, it's had a lot of um, other people involved and sponsoring it over the years. Uh, special thanks to Manningham, Knox Council, um, some Melbourne Water Funding and also Water Sensitive SA to, who have got behind this. But, um, what Insight Water is, is a way of getting these AR&R 
multiple criteria at a building scale and just working out a quick um, way to, um, I guess, figure out what, what we're doing uh, from an engineering point of view. So sizing your water tanks, for example, sizing your OSD, uh, figuring out how much of, um, uh, of the different systems you, you need um, uh, to actually achieve all these, these specific criteria. Um, so what the software is aiming to be is just uh, low cost online uh, integrated water management software for use uh, in buildings and plannings approvals. So I've designed this, I guess, from my perspective as Knox's water sensitive urban design uh, officer and sustainability officer. Um, and it's essentially a web form, but with enough engineering behind it that it doesn't forget about um, the questions that engineers want to ask, like, are we actually hitting the targets and how big are the tanks, those sort of things. So uh, what you do is you, you just load up the software, tell it what sort of development you have, how big, how many people uh, and where it is. Um, I'll just take you through quickly a, an existing example of the software um, just to, I guess, show it to you. Um, and then once you've got uh, your thing, your a site setup, you just tell it what the different areas of the building are. So you might have roof area, um, you might have some driveway, uh, you might add another impervious area, which might be a, a, uh, a car park. Let's just say um, we have a small car park. Um, and then it'll tell you basically whether you've passed all your different multiple criteria. Is the building water efficient? Uh, do you have enough um, uh, OSD or flow control going on? Have you hit water quality targets? And are your annual average volume results uh, okay according to standards? So into our impervious areas, we can add various different tools. So we have say a water tank. Uh, we might uh, say we had a development of, of uh, eight townhouses, each had a thousand liters of water tank. We can put that uh, into the tool. We can also put uh, tank top detention. So uh, in this case, we might um, have 500 litres of, of tank-based detention in each townhouse. Um, and that would just be a slow runoff, um, but it is a, a volume available for any major storm event, um, the way that ordinary detention would work. Um, or we can switch the tank-based detention off um, for our driveway, we might add uh, treatment devices. So uh, in the tool, you can add things like uh, pervious paving or rain gardens, um, and it'll show people, I guess, what they're, what they're talking about. Um, we also have manufactured devices in here. So um, seeing Ocean Protect is, is hosting us today. Um, you know, we could say 180, uh, one uh, square meters. Let's look at a Filtera, which is a, a biological uh, based rain garden, um, plug and play kind of thing. We have a device uh, uh, model, so that's one unit, I guess. And we know from this, um, this impervious area, uh, if you're doing a one in three month storm, the flow from that impervious area would be say 0.4 liters per second. And therefore you'd only need one of these devices. Um, if it was a much bigger impervious area, it would tell you you need three modules to treat that area. So we've just kind of uh, made a, a quick way of um, for people to size and I guess specify different uh, different treatment systems uh, for their different impervious areas. Um, there's an, there's a, a water tank balance that lets people I guess play with different building end uses. So why we've built a, a continuous simulation um, water tank model into here is um, we find if a water tank's working really well and looking like this with a low overflow, it's going to work quite well as a stormwater augmentation device. However, if a water tank's been built um, and say the demands are not appropriate for the tank size, you're going to get a hydrograph that looks like this and that means that um, 
uh, the tank's going to be as useless as a chocolate teapot, so to speak. So any water that comes into the tank's going to overflow straight away. So the tanks are going to be a bit useless for stormwater. So we want to get our, I guess, utilization rate and also work out our water efficiency. Now, I won't go um, too into all the other details here, only to say that there are advanced engineering sections here, particularly peak flow. Um, what we've actually built in is the Swinburne method um, or Boyd's equation for sizing OSD. And it lets you set things like time of concentration uh, for your design. You can override the PSD. You can set pre and post development runoff coefficients, um, all fun stuff for the civil engineers and, and uh, out there. Uh, if you've got no idea what I'm talking about at this point, don't worry. That's a it's a civil engineering thing, but um, the way we set up the software is that all the defaults should just work. Um, and if people don't touch anything, um, it should more or less give, still give a reasonable result for the OSD, which is here. Um, there's also other settings, like if you're doing Green Star um, commercial, the bath might not be applicable, for example. So you can, you can play with that um, and you can play with your volume uh, settings. So we've got the, Vic EPA stormwater target built into here. Um, and also the Green Star target is, is built into the tool as well, just to, for you to know if you pass that. But essentially you're trying to keep an eye on, uh, on these pass marks and the relevant standards. So that's it. It's all designed that, that a, a prof trained professional can uh, use the tool and optimize a design with, you know, in 20 or 30 minutes or less. Um, based on an existing building. Um, and it's also set up that council officers and, and relevant authorities can quickly review a, um, a report uh, and either approve it or not based on local standards and uh, local climate um, data. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty much my, uh, my spiel for the, um, uh, the software, um, the, uh, how it works, it, it is, um, uh, it, it is private software, but it, it's done in partnership and collaboration with a lot of different, uh, different people. Um, and, uh, it's supported either by professionals getting a subscription or by councils getting a subscription and making it free, uh, to use within their local council area. Um, so here's the, uh, the stormwater report that comes out of the tool that there can then be a bit of a stormwater specification document uh, for planning and building approvals. Um, so that's that's it for my, uh, I guess, presentation and slideshow. Um, I've noticed a, there's a few um, questions come through. So uh, I'll kick off, I guess, answering those. And, and if you've got any other questions, um, uh, we'll, we'll start. So. Cool. Um, Thank you, Ian. Yeah. So um, again, first up, th thanks so much for that presentation. Um, and just a reminder, if you do have questions, folks, uh, feel free to put them in the uh, Q&A section, uh, the Q&A tab, uh, which you'll find on your toolbar. And we've already had a, a, a bunch of questions come through already. Um, and so um, if you're ready to be grilled, uh, Ian, um, we can uh, get stuck into it. So first up, first, uh, first question very early on was from Michael Smith. Uh, Ian, uh, Ian yeah. uh, sorry, Michael says, uh, just for people who can't read the question. Hi, Ian. Uh, right at the beginning, you talked about a three-way split in responsibility for stormwater. Was it one-third to the building, one-third to the local council works, and one-third to the regional infrastructure solution? Did I get that right? And is it widespread? And it, is it a widespread approach slash understanding? Um, so thanks, Michael. Um, it, it's a, it is a good question. So it's, it's not universally understood, but I guess my point here is that to do integrated water management, particularly in existing urban areas with existing drainage systems. Um, we do need a kind of all of the above approach. Um, it's not necessarily a, a choice of doing this stuff with buildings or downstream with detention basins and, and regional wetlands. It's kind of a, a bit of everything. Um, and in order to find room for everything, it, it's, uh, it does require, I think, um, these different scaled approaches. So um, I guess I'm, um, uh, just coming from that point of view. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Uh, great question, Michael. Uh, next one was from Lachlan Gad. Uh, Lachlan asks, hi, Ian. I've been 
Actually, everyone's been very friendly today, aren't they? In they, they're saying hello, how are you? You know, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, Lachlan says, uh, I've been in the industry for over a year now, and I have come across many different modeling options. How is Insight Water different from other models like music or storm updated, storm, storm updated or drains? What does Insight Water have that they don't? And if you know, vice versa, kind of regards. Yes. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so there are, are lots of tools and, and they all have different strengths mm. and, and weaknesses. Um, so uh, the weakness of Insight is it, it doesn't do complex uh, drainage design of, of large uh, suburban, you know, suburb scale drainage systems. You'll need something more powerful like XP Swim for that. Um, music's better uh, at the larger scale as well, or it's optimized for subdivisions. Um, so uh, drains is very much about OSD and the hydraulics, but it doesn't really have the um, environmental stuff. So um, Insight Water is meant to be, I guess, a sweet spot of the environmental and hydraulic concerns um, optimized for buildings. So um, uh, as, a, as a sort of quick but effective uh, method of, of designing for buildings. So, um, you know, it has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, you can have a whole toolkit of tools. It doesn't, you don't have to do everything with a hammer. Um, um, you know, you can have a whole suite of different stormwater tools. And I think it's, uh, they're all useful for answering different questions. Very good. Thank you, Ian. Uh, another question from Nasanka. Uh, Nasanka asks, uh, I have a question about permeable pavings. Uh, the problem with these is the maintenance. Do you have any recommendations for durable, low maintenance and easily available permeable pavement types? Um, so good question. Um, so permeable paving can have issues, although it's a, it's a very established technology, particularly in Europe, where it's just used everywhere to reduce flooding. Um, uh, interestingly, um, your lab studies tend to have less durability because out in the wild you, with a lot of permeable paving, you tend to get life involved. So you've got a, a lot of microorganisms and ants and beetles and worms and, and uh, grass roots and things that tend to um, uh, clear up a lot of the clogging in a lot of permeable paving. Um, but ideally, you know, that should be one of your, your specification uh, questions. You know, how long is this going to last? What maintenance does it need? Uh, do we need to pressure wash it once a year? That sort of thing. Um, but um, yes, I don't have, uh, you know, a brand I can recommend, but uh, Brad might later <laughs> take him out to lunch. I gotta be very careful about recommending brands. Um, uh, but yeah, look, uh, um, next question was from Jacob Bryant. Um, Jacob uh, asks, uh, what council slash state requirements does the Insight Water tool have? Um, so uh, we've tried to put the data in for every urban council in Australia. So um, the... Uh, um, uh, when you load up your council in the tool, it'll load all the local AFDs and, and 20 years of, of data. So um, it's it's meant to be flexible. I will point out, though, there's a South Australian version that only works in South Australia that's been adopted as their default planning tool, um, and that's free to use. But um, if you're in South Australia, make sure you're using the right version. Um, I'm not sure exactly what other state and council requirements there are, um, but I will say that every council is slightly different. There's 500 of us. Mm. Um, and so I have tried to make the tool adaptable um, because every council is different. Um, so it should, as far as I know, it should be able to factor in pretty much everyone's local requirements, um, particularly things around PSD and mm. time of concentration and that sort of thing. And just to confirm, and it does take into consideration all obviously the, the variable climatic conditions between each area. So yeah. I'm guessing you've got the Euro meteorology rainfall data IFDs for each specific yeah. location, and that is and like if you it, can the person just or the modeler can just yeah. specify the location, and, and automatically the software knows what the rainfall pluviograph, all that sort yeah. of stuff is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously, a detention basin in Cairns is going to be very different from one down. Mm. In so um, the main factor is is those are the local IFDs and and. Mm. Uh, local rainfall data and obviously the, the 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 objectives may change from one location to the other like yep. you know in in southeast queensland we have a 60 percent tp target whereas obviously yep. some others have 45 percent, for example or whatever yep. um a question uh from vivian i can ask this one for you um um Ian, could mm -hmm. the slides be made available absolutely they will be made available on the ocean protect 
uh, website under the webinars tab as per all our, our uh, webinars. Alan West, greetings, Alan. Uh, Alan asks, uh, thanks, Ian. The million dollar question, is the order of costs for councils to subscribe to your impressive looking software to provide reports? Oh, How much is the cost, basically, Ian? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Alan. That's a, uh, that's a great question and one I, li I like being asked. But um, So the, the short answer is we try to keep it cheap. So um, if you're just a, a council officer sitting in a, in a dark corner with no management support for software, which unfortunately a lot of council officers are, um, we keep it under $1,000. Um, if it's more a council-wide thing, there's several people using it, you want some training and and, and uh, some, some customization, then it's, it's a few grand. Um, but so that's a thousand dollars for per individual council or yeah, individual per, staff per council if, if the yeah. council just wants to sign up um yeah and sign up the people in their lga and that's a one-off fee uh well, once a year yeah once it, so you're paying a thousand dollars once a year yeah 880 um a year yeah. okay cool um, um I hope that answers your question alan um a question from shian Sh uh uh, uh, they ask, uh, we are working on industrial commercial development. Can Insight Water be used for industrial and commercial buildings like um, large industrial sheds or storage buildings? Yes, yes. Um, so absolutely. So my, you know, my background as an ESD engineer is, is more on the commercial side than it is on residential. Um, and particularly for Green Star, it needs to be looking at the larger buildings. So yes, um, it works just as well for industrial. Um, the things I'd say for industrial is beware of putting too much roof area onto a tiny tank that doesn't get much use. That's going to be absolutely useless. Um, um, but you should be able to use the software to optimize, I guess, end uses and tank size and, and not have to connect a whole roof uh, to one poor overworked tank. Um, also, beware, I guess, of environmental management. If you've got any sort of refueling or chemical storage um, that come, comes under different regulations and you're going to want um, bunding and, and trade uh, drainage uh, and specialist gear from uh, as well. So uh, some slightly different uh, things get involved, but yes, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, industrial part of it. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, another question. The questions are coming in thick and fast, but again, please put the questions in the Q&A. Uh, ideally not in the chat. Yeah. A lot more easier, easier to track and we'll obviously get them answered. Um, question from uh, AJ Pal. Apologies if I've mispronounced that. Um, they ask, uh, this is probably carefully careful to answer this question because you've been asked about the performance of proprietary devices. Um, and we generally have at least half a dozen lawyers uh, watching our webinars, so uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> but um, they ask, how effective are the Envis, Envis pits? Should that be used in place of rain gardens? Because um, some councils are very strict regarding Envis pits and there is a lot of maintenance and blockage issues. Yeah, so I won't comment about Envis particularly. <laughs> um, uh, but a general comment about proprietary uh, things is, you know, there are, are times and places where they're probably appropriate, um, uh, particularly where you've just got a plumber who's turned up and they just want to plug something in. Um, a proprietary device is sometimes easier just to glue in, in place uh, for someone who's not particularly well trained uh, than, you know, creating a whole structured rain garden with the, the right layers and, and the right plant selection and things. It's, um, it's a bit more than your average plumber's trained to do. Um, you know, that, that said, there are strengths and weaknesses around all these systems and, and maintenance requirements, which is, um, mm. a, a, a chat for another day, probably. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And just on the topic of proprietary devices. So like that, you, you mentioned, there's a few devices in there already, et cetera. H how do, how does, how do you take into consideration the various claims of proprietary device manufacturers? Um, so how is that, is there any review process at all? or um you know what, what's involved so if i'm a i am working for protect if i want to put my devices into your software um yep. what sort of scrutiny is given on whatever claim i might make about my device um so yeah uh full disclosure there is a, a manufacturer subscription available for to put devices in but um you know essentially our process is to look at this stuff as engineers we look at the specifications we look at the science we look at the evidence uh and we don't put um junk into uh, the, the top, the, the software. So, um, you know, well-tested devices from reputable manufacturers go in, but um, your Bunnings special might not be in there. So, um, but we also do do our own reviews and, and also use third-party scientific reports and things like the Squid App program as mm. well comes into it. Mm. 
Yeah, and look, to be honest, full disclosure, that's great to hear because one of our biggest concerns is just a software just applying whatever the performance claims might be of manufacturers. So if there's a level of scrutiny, whatever that might be, um, that's that's a real positive because I, I think from my perspective, and I was living in Hobart uh, last week and there's a lot of councils down there in particular struggling with, you know, how to review these performance claims. And and I think this historical uh, assumption that oh, it's up to council to uh, approve or, or not whatever the performance claims might be. It's very difficult for various councils to do. Generally, they don't have the time and resources to do that. So if there's some sort of centralized review process within the software uh, and providers, um, that's a real positive from my perspective. Yeah. Um, a question from Sophia McRae. Uh, Sophia says, um, hi, I am the ESD specialist at Kingston Council in Southeast Melbourne, uh, working with the state planners. Is the Insight... Uh, water tools something that state planners can use or is it better for the planners to refer to our engineers and have our engineers use it and provide the improved IWM design back to the planner and applicant okay great question so yeah, they're all great questions aren't they? <laughs> yeah. so this this software was designed for you and the answer of really why I did it was to bring peace between engineering and planning um, because at Knox, I'd be putting in rain gardens and the, the drainage engineers would cross it out and put in OSD. And that went on for years um, because we were using different tools and different guidelines and, and we just didn't speak each other's language. So um, really Insight is um, about uh, an integrated process that the stat planners can get the uh, environmental requirements and the integrated water management uh, requirements that are in the Victorian planning scheme ticked off, um, but also produce something that the engineers uh, in building approvals aren't going to roll their eyes at. They're, they're actually going to get something useful out of it as well. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, the short answer to a very long and complicated question. Cool. That's okay. Um, thank you, Ian. Uh, another question from Michelle Gilson. Uh, uh, she says, those costs are uh, just discussed. Ian mentioned earlier that councils could subscribe to a plan that gives free access for their customers to use the system. Did I hear this wrong? What is the cost for that sort of subscription? Um, no, you heard it right. So if a council gets a council subscription, everyone in that LGA can use the software for free. Um, uh, that is attractive. It's it's very good value. Um, yeah. You know, we're just trying to cover our costs. It's... it's uh, um, so it's set at a, at a low, uh, a low fee of, um, can be less than a thousand dollars, as I said, um, for a, a basic subscription. Um, and if you need a bit more training and support, it kind of goes up from that. But mm. yeah, that's really positive. Um, cause I'm guessing that it's, it's obviously targeted, like you said, the niche is, you know, not too complicated sites, but the, the stock standard small developments, where it's a fairly simple solution, whatever the solution might be. Yeah. And it's obviously expediating the DA process for council as well. Yeah, well, being in councils, when you're asking for something, you don't necessarily want to incur a cost every time you open mm. your mouth for, for the applicants. So. Yeah, well, that's cool. That's very interesting. Um, this is a bit of a, um, a high-level question uh, from Cyril, uh, Cyril Samuel. Um, uh, they say, hi, Ian and Brad. I'm a beginner in the, in, in the industry. Not sure how relevant this question is to the session, but what are your thoughts about putting in rain gardens and bioswales, et cetera? Um, so once again, um, uh, plenty of disclaimers there, they have a, a, a time and a place. So at Knox, we tend to discourage rain gardens now in townhouses, um, because we, we find there's just not enough room to do it well and not necessarily enough professional knowledge on site to, to do them well. So, um, our standard approach and, and more than a lot of other Melbourne councils are taking, doing this as well is, uh, is a combination preferably of rain tanks and permeable paving. Um, with pro probably some tank-based attention rather than, than underground attention as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the approach that has uh, been taken by Adelaide as well. Um, so uh, rain gardens and bioswales are probably, we, we use them a lot or encourage them a lot um, in the larger commercial and uh, industrial um, uh uh, sorry, larger commercial and industrial developments where there is some room um, around the car parks. There's uh, likely to be some sort of level of, of maintenance um, uh, in terms of litter and, and mowing and, and plant-based stuff. So, um, yeah, it's we, the, the medium to larger stuff, I think, is the appropriate place for 
rain gardens and bioswales at the moment. Yeah, cool. Provided they work and provided they get maintained, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but look, that's uh, if anyone has any final questions, yeah. uh, you are welcome to put them in. Yeah. Uh, but look, we're pretty There's much a final planning. one from uh, Sophia as well. Yes, yeah, statutory planning, not state planning. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Ian. But look, if there's no more final questions, uh, just a reminder, if you do have, well, sorry, I guess we should point out, if you do have a question to uh, Ian, uh, you know, following on from today, uh, or if you'd like to talk to Ian directly, obviously his contact details are on the screen there. Uh, I'm sure he's more than happy to talk further about uh anything and everything discussed today so uh but look uh, thank you for everyone who's dialed into the uh presentation today it's fantastic uh, really informative uh, session very popular i think we had over 140 people in attendance uh thanks so thanks everyone for coming along really appreciate it and I, obviously a very special thank you to ian that was a fantastic presentation and uh he answered the questions very well so uh, well done to you. And I, I do promise you there are a whole bunch of people listening in and watching. So uh, well done. It wasn't just you and me having a chat. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. And yes, if you want to know more, um, jump on our website. There's training available and and uh, or, or chat to me. Um, uh, I'd love to speak to you. Thank cool. you very much. And thanks, thanks guys. For this. Anytime, Ian. Thanks again, guys. Much appreciated. Enjoy the rest of your day.